Well, hello. Today I want to do a little primer on the intestinal roundworms that are pathogens for human beings. Uh, so general characteristics. Uh, there are both free living forms. One example is strongyloides, and there are parasitic forms like enterobius. The size of adults can range from a few millimeters to greater than one meter. They have separate sexes. Males are smaller, uh, dorsally curved posterior. There's an anterior buccal capsule that may contain hooks, teeth, or cutting plates. People, humans, are the definitive host. And pathogenicity is due to either larval migration, piercing the intestinal wall, blood sucking, and allergic reaction. Enterobius vermicularis, the pinworm. This is the most common worm infection in the United States, and it's very common in children. The life cycle, the eggs are deposited on the perianal folds. Uh, Self-infection occurs by transferring infective eggs to the mouth with hands that have been scratching the perianal area. Person-to-person -per -person transmission can also occur through handling of contaminated clothes or bed linens. Enterobiasis may also be acquired through surfaces in the environment that are contaminated with pinworm eggs, like curtains and carpeting. Some small number of eggs may become airborne, airborne and inhaled. These would be swallowed and follow the same development as ingested eggs. Eggs become infective in four to six hours under optimal conditions. Symptoms and pathology. The most common clinical manifestation of pinworm infection is an itchy anal area. When the infection is heavy, there can also be secondary bacterial infection due to the irritation and scratching of the anal area. Often the patient will complain of teeth grinding and insomnia due to disturbed sleep, or even abdominal pain or appendicitis. Infection of the female genital tract has been well reported. Diagnosis. The eggs measure about 50 to 60 microns by 20 to 30 microns. They are elongate and oval and slightly flattened on one side, giving them a loaf of bread appearance. They can be diagnosed by applying cellulose tape to the anus of a suspected patient, especially in the morning before the patient's first bowel movement. Eggs will adhere to the tape and can be seen microscopically. Occasionally, adult females may be found. Examining stool samples is not recommended. And this is a pinworm paddle. This is the same principle as the scotch tape or the cellulose tape method. And it's just a plastic paddle with a sticky end and you press it against the perianal folds. Trichuris trichura, also known as the whipworm. And it's known for this because of its appearance, a long whip-like anterior end. This is one of the soil transmitted helminths of major importance and an estimated about 600 to 800 million people in the world are infected with whipworm. Whipworm, hookworm, and ascaris are known as the soil transmitted helminths of the parasitic worms. Life cycle. The adult worms that are about four centimeters in length live in the cecum and colon. Unembryonated eggs are passed with a stool. Eggs become infective in 15 to 30 days then they are ingested by a human. Eggs hatch in the small intestine and release larvae that mature and establish themselves as adults in the colon. Symptoms and pathology. People with light infections usually have no symptoms. People with heavy symptoms can experience frequent painful passage of stool that contain a mixture of mucus, water, and blood. Rectal prolapse, as in the picture, can also occur. Heavy infection in children can lead to severe anemia, growth retardation, and impaired cognitive development. Diagnosis. Trichuris trichura eggs are about 50 to 55 micrometers by 20 to 25 micrometers. Very characteristic, characteristic appearance. They are barrel-shaped, 
thick-shelled, and possess a pair of polar plugs at each end. The eggs are unembryonated when the, passed in the stool. Ascaris lumbricoides, the giant intestinal roundworm. Ascaris lumbricoides is one of, the, one of the commonest and most widespread of all human parasites, with an estimated about 1 billion people infected any time in the world at one time. It is found in association with poor personal hygiene, poor sanitation, and in places where human feces are used as fertilizer. This, like Trichuris, is a soil-transmitted helminth. Life cycle. Infection occurs by ingestion of the infective egg in contaminated food or drink or from the contaminated hand. Uh, following ingestion, the larva hatches in the small intestine, penetrates the blood vessels in the small intestinal wall. Then there's a larval migration, liver to lung to alveoli to pharynx. After migrating up the trachea, the larvae are swallowed. In the small intestine, they grow into mature worms. After mating, the female produces large numbers of eggs, about 200,000 eggs per day per female are passed in the feces, which are passed in the feces. Symptoms and pathology. If symptoms do occur, they can be light and include abdominal discomfort. Heavy infections can cause intestinal blockage and impair growth in children. Other symptoms such as cough are due to migration of the worms through the body. And you frequently see high eosinophilia. Diagnosis. Fertilized and unfertilized Ascaris lumbricoides eggs are passed in the stool of the infected host. The fertilized eggs are rounded and have a thick shell with an external mammillated layer or a corticated layer that is often stained brown by bile. In some cases, the outer layer is absent, known as decorticated eggs. Fertile eggs range from about 45 to 75 microns in length. Unfertilized are elongated and larger than fertile eggs, up to 90 microns in length. Their shell is thinner and their mammillated layer is more variable, either with large protuberances or practically none. Unfertile eggs contain mainly a mass of refractile granules, and the content is amorphous. And these are some drawings of the different types of eggs that you may see in the stool. On the left, of course, is the um, fertilized corticated egg. In the middle, the unfertilized egg. And on the right, the decorticated fertilized egg. And again, here's some more pictures. These are unfertilized eggs, uh, one with no mammalation, and on the right, one with lots of mammalation. Fertilized eggs, um, on the left, corticated, and on the right, decorticated. Hookworms. Ankylostoma duodenale and Nicator americanus, the old, wor old world hookworm and the new world hookworm, respectively. There's an estimated 576 to 740 million people in the world infected with hookworm. Eggs are diagnostic, larvae are rarely. Rhabditiform larva, the non-infective first stage larva. Then there's the flariform larva, second stage infective larva, which are free living. Um, many times people get infected with a hookworm by being barefoot on contaminated soil. Life cycle. Adults in the small intestine, the eggs are eggs and feces are most favorable condition under most favorable conditions, moisture, warmth, and shade. Uh, the larvae hatch in about one to two days. They release the rhabditiform larva that's grown in the feces or in the soil. After five to ten days and two molts, they become filariform or third stage larvae that are infective. The larvae penetrate the skin and are carried through the blood vessels to the heart and then to the lungs. They penetrate into the pulmonary alveoli, ascend the bronchial tree to the pharynx, and are swallowed. 
The larvae reach the small intestine where they reside and mature into adults. And here's a picture of the life cycle. Symptoms and pathology. Ground itch. This is a severe itching at the site of larval penetration. Uh, larval migration, you may see blood in the sputum. Most people infected with hookworms have no symptoms. Heavier infections, you may see iron deficiency anemia caused by blood loss at the site of intestinal attachment of the adult worms. It is the most common symptom of hookworm infection. Diagnosis. Egg and occasionally the rhabditiform larva may be found in the stool. The eggs of an ankylostoma and nicator cannot be differentiated microscopically. So if you see them, you would call them hookworm species. The eggs are thin shelled, colorless, and measure about 60 to 70 microns by 35 to 40 microns. The embryo that's seen inside, you may see the, a two to eight cell stage of cleavage. Then there's the differentiation of the mouth parts if you were to have the adult. Uh, Nicator americanus on the left hand side with the rounded cutting plates. And you can see it like there and there. And then Calistoma duodenale on the right with the sharp teeth for attachment. The hookworm rhabditiform larva. Rhabditiform L1 larva that hatch from the eggs are about 250 to 300 microns long and about 15 to 20 microns wide. They have a long buccal canal and an inconspicuous genital primordium. Rhabditiform larvae are usually not found in stool, but may be found if there is a delay in processing the stool sample. If larvae are seen in the stool, they must be differentiated from the L1 larva of Strongyloides stercoralis. Strongyloides stercoralis, aka the threadworm. All stages are free living, and they enter the body through exposed skin, such as bare feet, much like hookworm. And this is a, a lot of life cycle stuff here, but it's basically broken down into two cycles. One is the free living cycle, um, and then the other one is the parasitic cycle. And here's a picture of each. There's two important terms that go along with Strongyloides stercoralis, and that's autoinfection and hyperinfection. Autoinfection. This is a situation where the non-infective rhabditiform larvae become infective filariform larvae before leaving the body. The filariform larvae may penetrate the intestinal wall or the perianal skin to continue reinfecting the person. There are two roundworm infections that are capable of doing this, strongyloides and capillaria philippinensis. This can keep the, infect the individual infected for years, up to 35 years according to one text. Hyperinfection. Rarely autoinfection with the increasing worm burden can lead to dissemination and hyperinfection of the individual. This typically occurs in somebody who's immunocompromised, though it's not exclusive. People with HIV infection or those taking drugs that suppress the immune system are particularly vulnerable. Disseminated strongyolysis occurs in immunosuppressed patients, can present with abdominal pain, distension, shock, pulmonary and neurological complications, septicemia, and is potentially fatal. Diagnosis. Diagnosis rests on the microscopic identification of the larva, the rhabditiform, and occasionally the filariform in the stool or duodenal fluid. Rhabditiform larva of Strongyloides stercoralis in an unstained wet mound of stool. You can see that in this picture. And notice the prominent genital primordium, that's the blue arrow. The rhabditiform esophagus, that's the red arrow. And the short buccal canal, that's the green arrow. And this is one way to diagnose it is by using the entero test or the string test. And basically, the patient swallows a weight on the end of a string. It goes down into to the, into the gut. 
you tape the string to the side of the face. After a period of time, you pull it out, the string, and then you examine the uh, mucousy duodenal fluid on the string, put that on a microscope, and look for the rhabditiform larva under the microscope slide. And lastly, um, to differentiate hookworm larva um, from strongyloides, what you can see is the rhabditiform larva, hookworm, long buccal cavity, equal to the width of the body. Strongyloides, short buccal cavity, equal to half the width of the body. For the flariform larva in soil, hookworm has a pointed tail, and strongyloides has a notched tail. Okay, I hope you enjoy this. Thanks a lot.